Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, afternoon, or evening, actually, to all of you, and thank you very much for joining us. Today will be a timely discussion, as the COVID pandemic has highlighted the importance of international cooperation on health-related issues and is actually providing us with opportunities for bold new initiatives. We have a great panel today, uh, made up of people who have shown over time interest and a lot of expertise on this subject matter. Our first speaker is Ambassador Juan Ramon de la Fuente, permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations in New York, who has a long-standing interest on that issue and actually served as health secretary in the government of President Ernesto Zedillo. Our second speaker today, Her Excellency Henrietta Bogopanizulu, Deputy Minister of Social Development in South Africa. Her ministry has the lead on drug policy and she led the South African negotiations for the African Union Plan of Action on Drugs. She's therefore a critical voice on this matter on the continent. Our third speaker today, Ambassador Jörg Lauber, Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the United Nations in Geneva. You will remember that Ambassador Lauber served in a similar capacity in New York and actually co-facilitated with Ambassador Juan Jose Gomez Gamacho the negotiations which led to the adoption in December 2018 of the Global Compact for Migration. Having worked very closely with him in that process, I'm really delighted to having him join the discussion today, particularly since Switzerland has been such a lead actor in the drug reform movement for many, many years. Our fourth speaker today is His Excellency Akin Steiner, Administrator of UNDP, also an old friend and former colleague, whose work is critical to the implementation of the UN system common position on drugs, and who's been a very clear voice on the development and human rights aspect of drug policy. Our fifth and last speaker, His Excellency Martin Chungong, Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. We're delighted to see IPU's interest in drug policy reform as the interplay between national and international initiatives becomes ever more important. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the Global Commission on Drug Policy. This commission was created in 2011. Its first chair and great leader was Fernando Henrique Cardozo, former president of Brazil. He was then followed by Ruth Dreyfus of Switzerland, also a long-standing advocate uh, on many issues, including drug policy reform. And as of this year, our new chair is well known to you, Helen Clark of New Zealand. The commission is composed of 26 members, including 14 former heads of states and government, former UN officials, business and cultural leaders. The background I think is of the commission is really interesting. It came from the work of the Latin American Commission on Drugs and Democracy, which had been convened by President Cardozo in 2007. This provided the impetus for change and the work of the Latin American Commission actually started breaking the taboo against revisiting the foundations of the so-called war on drugs. Slowly, a broader international effort emerged, uh, particularly in 2011, originally with a few European leaders, such as uh, Ruth Dreyfus of Switzerland and Jorge Sampaio of Portugal, and led to today's position where we have representations from all over the world. The late Secretary General Kofi Annan joined the Global Commission and convened in 2014 the West Africa Commission on Drugs. So the work of the Commission is now geographically widespread and continues to be based on five important pathways. The first one, which has been stressed throughout our work, is putting people's health first. The second the uh, approach to the work is prioritizing access to essential medicines, then ending the criminalization of people who use drugs, an increasingly uh, progressive uh, position that has been taken in many countries and regions, reforming the international response to drug trafficking and organized crime, <clears throat> and finally, 
legally regulating drug markets to put governments, not crime organizations, in full control. This last pathway of our work is the one that, in time, will require reform of the International Drug Control uh, Commission's and system. Let me say a few words about the position of the, glo the Global Commission on the International Drug Control System. Both the norms, conventions, and international governance structures related to drug policies are outdated and in need of substantial reform. International cooperation is more important than ever. Neither national initiatives nor the UN secretariat agencies, funds, and programs can be an adequate substitute for the work that needs to be done by member states to reform and amend the drug control conventions. And while individual states and regions continue to move forward with needed reforms, the whole multilateral legal structure cannot be left behind and become totally obsolete, irrelevant, or worse, obstructionist. The lead of Secretary General Guterres through the CEB, the Chief Executive Board, in the adoption of the UN system common position on drugs, now almost two years ago, paves the way. The Global Commission has documented, analyzed, and published very extensively on the needed reforms of the multilateral drug control system. We've adv advocated several measures in great details, but let me just emphasize a couple of the ones that are, I think, very relevant to our conversation today. Repositioning the mandate of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs for it to focus on legal access and on limiting the diversion of drugs to illegal markets, while at the same time, broadening control options for these options to include the legal regulation of drugs for recreational purposes as an effective alternative to failed prohibition measures. We've also advocated for member states to consider the merger of the 1961 and 1971 conventions and several other initiatives that would serve to refocus the work of the United Nations on the wide range of activities related to transnational crime and at the same time widen the spectrum of drug control concerns to encompass health, human rights, rather than at the current overwhelmingly focus on crime and law enforcement. And finally, we've also advocated allowing WHO and the Human Rights Council mechanisms to address adequately drug-related issues that fall within their mandates. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Ambassador Juan Ramon de la Fuente, permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations in New York. Ambassador, you have the floor. Hello, I am Juan Ramon de la Fuente, current uh, ambassador of Mexico to the UN and former Secretary of Health. And I want to express my gratitude to the Global Commission on Drug Policy for organizing this event uh, very timely uh, on the future of multilateral drug policy. As uh, we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, uh, we have an excellent occasion to reaffirm, first of all, that multilateralism and international cooperation represent the best formula to analyze, attend, and respond to the most complex global challenges, including, of course, the world drug phenomenon. The current situation that the whole world is facing as a consequence of COVID-19 pandemic demands us more than ever, perhaps, to place the goals of drug policies on people rather than on substances. According to the latest edition of the World Drug Report, it is likely that in the middle and long term, the economic recession and the restrictions associated with the pandemic have the potential to change the availability of various substances and therefore the patterns of drug use and abuse, especially in vulnerable sectors. 
increased unemployment, frustration, isolation, depression, anxiety, and lack of opportunities in general could serve as factors that are triggering new harmful trends on substance abuse. So uh, in my view, cautions are appropriate at this time of uncertainty. In Mexico, some legal decisions uh, regarding cannabis, for instance, were to be paused because of COVID-19 pandemic, but no so the decisions of the government to reinforce addressing some of the structural causes behind consuming patterns such as poverty, marginalization, and lack of opportunities. And also a fresh and reinvigorating approach to comprehensive prevention, all of it as additional tools to enrich and reform current drug policies in face of the pandemic. As we all know, international drug efforts have focused much more on control and prohibition and they have left behind commitments to ensure the public health approach, access to substances for medical and scientific purposes, and responsible, innovative regulations of certain substances. Given the complexities of the new realities of international drugs market and the ineffective results of the war on drugs, characterized only by prohibitionist and punitive measures, it is still clear the need we have for changes, the need to update and widening the international drug control regime. Let me briefly share with you three conceptions that uh, uh, considering the current multilateral scenario, uh, in my view, all responses to the needs of reforms and drug policies must take into account. First, to better recognize the world drug problem as a matter of public health and human rights. It is not only a security and law enforcement issue, but more than ever, we do need to generate a balance between demand and supply reduction measures. People with drug abuse disorders require medical support and treatment. It has been shown that criminalization, stigmatization, and incarceration are incentives that do not counter the problem, but rather worsen it. Recent evidence has also alerted us about the negative consequences that women are facing and the barriers that some vulnerable populations, such as people in prison, uh, minorities and migrants, find to access and to receive appropriate health services and treatment due to discrimination, stigmatization, criminalization. Instead of promoting application of cruel and disproportionate punishment that have ineffectively punished the weakest affected communities, which by the way, are often co-opted by criminal groups, we need, instead of that, to promote a cross-cutting on human rights and gender drug policy. Two, to take immediate action to align efforts in drug policy with the achievements of the 2030 agenda. The government in Mexico is committed with the international community to close inequality gaps, to promote social justice, solidarity, and the resilience of societies. I believe it's time to echo these calls to the international drug control policy and to adopt from now on a more comprehensive set of responses based on justice, peace, and sustainable development. By doing so, we will be better addressing the consequences of the world drug problem and the illicit markets such as arms trafficking and illicit financial flows that have greatly strengthened drug trafficking organizations and which have fuel in Mexico and in other countries of the world, violence and crimes. Third, to make the reform of drug policies a two-way road of global and local development. International drug control policy cannot remain as it has been for many years. When these days the dynamics, trends, and challenges are completely different, it is time to move on by recognizing and learning 
from changes and innovative approaches and regulations that have happened at national and local levels as well. There is no one single better way of dealing with this problem. There are different options and we need to learn from one to another and based on the experiences of the communities and the data that are rigorously collected. Implementation of important international commitments, such as the operational recommendation of the UN GAS 2016, the outcome document, must be enhanced, but a better understanding of what is happening in our communities and local and national legislations will put on the table more interesting models that, if promising, I believe, must be replicated in order to reach a comprehensive, flexible, evidence-based international strategy. We are facing tough times, uh, but I think there are also times for opportunity. If we want to build back better and differently in the drug problem globally, this is a good time to start thinking differently based on our new reality and on the evidence we've gathered. A number of things have moved into the right direction, but there are others that have not. And those are the ones that we need to review with a fresh approach and an open mind. Mexico will continue to be a, a reliable partner in uh, this endeavor, and we look very much forward to seeing you personally, hopefully in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank Ambassador de la Fuente, and it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Her Excellency Henrietta Bogopanezulu, Deputy Minister of Social Development in South Africa. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Abo, for the introduction. Um, this, uh, Your Excellency's Chairperson of the 75th UN General Assembly, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the critical role that has been played by the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the International Narcotics Control Board, and the Expert Committee on Drug Dependency of the World Health Organization, amongst others. We would like to really compliment them in the fight against the world drug problem and the guidance evidence-based solutions that they grant us. We acknowledge the existence of the three international drug control conventions, the 2016 UNGAS outcome document, the adoption of the 2019 ministerial declarations. These documents uh, go a long way in actually changing and making real and giving effect to the need for the multilateral uh, review of drug policy. Your Excellencies, we call for the review of these conventions mentioned above since the 2009 political declaration and the call for a drug-free world, we have seen considerable increase in the availability of illicit drugs, their uh, availability, their transportation, their trafficking, and them actually feeding a, a whole lot of an illicit economy in our respective countries, in particular in the continent of Africa. Your Excellencies, uh, we are calling uh, South Africa on the review of all of the treatment protocols that we use as member states as we believe that they need to be human rights based for that we ensure that the inherent dignity of our service users are at the center. When the services are user centric, we ensure that we actually begin to do a number of things. Amongst them is to actually reduce the punitive war based language on the issues of drugs for that has not led any of us to being successful in the fight against drugs. But we need to begin to focus on the social welfare services so we are able to put uh, the drug user at the center, but to also ensure that they've got access to the critical medicines that they need. 
albeit the prices being so high, uh, one of the calls for the UN General Assembly to consider is a process of the reduction of prices in the terms of the access of opiate therapies as well as any uh, therapeutic drugs that would enable and facilitate a drug um, rehabilitation, but making it also affordable and accessible. It is important that uh, our member states actually begin to increase our pharmacovigilance as this has been one of the barriers that has made access to, med access to pain medication, access to basic uh, medicines a, a real challenge. So it is important that we revisit at a multilateral level the scheduling of medicines as well as the access so that we are able as member states to achieve the universal access that we require. There is an increase and in a growing um, population of intravenous drug users that are becoming a bit of a challenge for all of us as member states as we fight blood bond related diseases, but also as we trying to get to where we are 90-90-90 in terms of 2030, an AIDS free world, which might necessarily not be achievable. And we are requesting that the United Nations ensures that uh, the treatment protocols of member states emphasizes access to hepatitis medication, but also hepatitis should become part of the basic primary health care and rehabilitation as well as detoxification services for our intravenous drug users to enable us to fight any bloodborne diseases. Chairperson, allow me to also indicate that South Africa has finalized its drug master plan, taking it and led by the drug master plan uh, developed by the African Union. Having led the African Union in the development of this document, but also in the acknowledgement that South Africa is a gateway uh, geographically and otherwise in terms of drugs and illicit trafficking by, uh, for humans and by drugs. So we're saying, we are requesting the review of um, the access to such drugs, but also that the law enforcement agencies should separate the addiction of the user and the criminal aspect of it. As we've realized that with our underdeveloped criminal justice system, the arrests and the criminalization of small drug use quantities for personal use has overburdened our system and has made access to services a real challenge. We're therefore requesting and calling on the United Nations, the World Health Organizations, and all of the multilateral bodies that are playing a role in the issues around, around drugs and the reduction, the harm, the availability thereof to ensure that we recognize not only the inherent human rights of the drug users, but we begin to criminalize the, 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 the perpetrator, the trafficker, and not necessarily the user. That will assist us to address stigma, to reduce um, what families are going through, and it will make our access to community-based advocacy awareness and elevate prevention, prevention, prevention. For without our elevated prevention programs, we will not be able to actually arrive at a drug-free world that we all aspire to. As I conclude, uh, Chairperson, allow me to thank the commissioners for the excellent work that they are doing. We want to thank um, the UNODC for the guidance, technical and financial to a whole lot of member states but the UN family in general for ensuring that as and whenever we call for assistance, we are given the required assistance. We want to also thank those families that continue to allow us to be uh, the, those that we test our evidence based, those that allow us to do our epidemiological uh, surveillance on them. But we also want to give thanks to the many scientists and the many epidemiologists that continue to give us the answers of what we actually need. In South Africa, our drug problem is a designer drug problem. 
which complicates our rehabilitation strategy and access to rehabilitation in general. That as it may be, we are continuing to increase access to treatment facilities as we opened a three a drug rehab facilities, which are absolutely free, so that we ensure that universalization is actually achieved. We honor and pay tribute to the many that have passed on uh, due to the abuse of drugs. And as such, call on member states to actually abandon the issue of a ban on traveling for drug users, as this does not only further stigmatize them, but it takes away that which we believe in, that nothing about them without them. Their inability to be physically present where they are discussed continue to make us to actually make a lot of assumptions. We thank the UN family. We wish everyone the best of luck. And as we all stay home, stay safe, and face the COVID-19 virus the best way we know how. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Ms. Henrietta Bogatpane Zulu for her remarks. And it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Ambassador Jörg Glauber, permanent representative of Switzerland to the United Nations in Geneva. Ambassador Lauber, you have the floor. Honorable speakers, excellencies, dear participants, reforms can be accomplished only when attitudes are changed. This quote from Lillian Wald, a humanitarian nurse, fits the context of Swiss drug policy. In our country, reforms have been made possible and proven successful thanks to the change in public attitude towards drug users. But before developing this point, please allow me to express Switzerland's deep appreciation for the work of the Global Commission on Drug Policy and the interesting analysis and reflections the Commission is providing. I am honoured to take the floor today and having the opportunity to reflect on multilateral drug policy in the current context of a rapidly changing world. As already mentioned, policy reforms enable Switzerland to find a better approach in tackling drug consumption issues. Until the 1990s, the escalation of open drug scenes, such as the commonly known needle park in Zurich, led to questioning the effectiveness of the three-pillar approach consisting of action in prevention, therapy and repression. Alternative solutions to shape drug policies in a different way were developed and the four pillars strategy was adopted by a federal referendum in 2008 by 68 percent of voters. The introduction of the harm reduction pillar represents an important achievement of Swiss drug policy. It aims at reducing the negative consequences of drug consumption for the consumers but also for society as a whole. This approach has also enabled us to come up with innovative methods to reduce the health and social harm for drug users. For instance, we experienced a decline in the number of HIV infections, a decline in AIDS-related death among drug users, a decline in the number of drug-related deaths, and an improvement in public safety and security. But most importantly, it marked the beginning of a new era whereby drug addiction was seen as an illness and therefore drug users were seen as patients and not as delinquents. Despite this encouraging positive evolution, Switzerland is permanently facing new challenges, such as poly consumption. These difficulties are shared by our European neighbors. The World Drug Report 2020 provides us with a good picture of these new challenges. They include the expansion of the drug market due to the growing number of new substances on the illicit drug market. Another challenge is the increased complexity of the market driven by multiple factors such as urbanization, population change and socio-economic disadvantages. We are also witnessing worldwide insufficient access to and availability of controlled substances for medical treatments overall, but particularly in humanitarian settings. Tragically, the COVID-19 pandemic accentuates these challenges by creating a context that promotes new manufacturing processes. 
as restrictions on movement constrict access to essential chemicals and substances, new trafficking routes emerge. The World Drug Report 2020 highlights the potential of further expansion of the illicit drug market with the economic downturn. There is a fear that with increased socioeconomic needs, disadvantaged people could engage in illegal activities such as drug production, transport and trafficking. We are living in uncertain times and Switzerland remains concerned about the protection of marginalized people such as drug consumers. The world has significantly changed and so have the drug scenes, consumption, availability and supply chains. The drug market expansion was also made possible because of digital technologies such as the internet and the dark web. Ways and means to address the global drug problem have to evolve and go with the time. Important issues that should be better reflected in our work are the framework of the Agenda 2030, as well as the respect for human rights obligations. In this regard, the International Guidelines on Human Rights and Drug Policy, funded by Switzerland and Germany, provide a comprehensive set of international legal standards aimed at placing human dignity and sustainable development at the center of member states' response to the world drug problem. Additionally, we should better take public health needs into account. The European Commission seems to have fully understood the need for this holistic approach. By adopting the new EU agenda and action plan on drugs for 21-25, the European Union intends to protect citizens through comprehensive action addressing security challenges and health implications of drug trafficking and drug use. Dear participants, taking into account all the changes occurring in the drug area, we need to further enhance dialogue among states to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. I already mentioned the need to respect human rights and to take the Agenda 2030 into account. In short, we need to place the human being at the core of our drug policies look at different aspects of the global drug problem and work across sectors. With references to SDG 17, we need to enhance multi-stakeholder cooperation and bring together relevant actors. Among them is the civil society, whose involvement is one of the cornerstones of European drugs policy, including academia and frontline workers. We also need to encourage greater interagency cooperation among UN entities. In this respect, Switzerland welcomes the UN Common Position on Drugs. It encourages 31 UN agencies to speak with one voice, to develop sustainable solutions and to increase the effectiveness in responding to the world drug problem. The interconnected nature of the world drug problem brings us naturally to international Geneva. Geneva is one of the foremost centers of global governance and inter alia home to the global health and human rights constituencies. With its focus on cross-sectoral and cross-institutional cooperation, Geneva is ideally placed to develop solutions to the multidimensional challenges we are faced with today. Certainly, Vienna plays an important role regarding the world drug problem. UNODC is the main UN center of competence for drug policy and the Vienna-based Commission on Narcotic Drugs is the policy-making body with prime responsibility for drug control matters. However, a multifaceted global problem, such as the world drug problem, must be addressed through comprehensive strategies based on a multi-stakeholder approach. This is where Geneva, as well as other locations, come into play. Honorable speakers, excellencies, dear participants, referring to Lillian Wald again, Switzerland believes that we need to change our attitudes towards people who use drugs in order to make progress in the international drug control policy area. With a compassionate and humane attitude, we can contribute to this common endeavor and make positive change happen. Thank you for your attention. I want to thank Ambassador Lauber for his remark, and it's now my pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency Aken Steiner, Administrator of UNDP. Mr. Steiner, you have the floor. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to thank you for this invitation to speak on the leadership of the UN system on drug policy in the last decade. It comes at a pertinent time. 
According to the 2020 World Drug Report, 269 million people used illicit drugs in the year 2018, a massive 30 percent rise from 2009. While the use of illicit drugs is highest in developed countries, the increase is more pronounced in developing countries where populations are younger. It is also the poorest who suffer the greatest burden of drug disorders. The illicit drugs issue is complex and global in nature, spanning the human rights, development and peace and security pillars of the United Nations. The issue also cuts across the 2030 agenda and multiple SDGs, including improving health and well-being, ending poverty and achieving gender equality. The COVID-19 pandemic is now presenting us with a range of new challenges. While it may be too early to understand the full impacts of COVID-19 on illicit drug markets and drug use, evidence is emerging about people who use drugs and need harm reduction services being disproportionately affected by lockdowns. Other issues that have come to the surface include excessive policing and inadequate access to services. Indeed, rising unemployment and plummeting opportunities are expected to affect the poorest the most, making them more vulnerable to illicit drug use. It is also vital that the perspectives and needs of the poor and marginalized, including indigenous peoples and poor farmers who cultivate illicit drug crops, are considered and included in the socioeconomic responses. As we know, the UN system, Common Position on Drug Policy, commits us to supporting member states in developing and implementing balanced, comprehensive, integrated, evidence-based, human rights-based, development-oriented and sustainable responses to the world drug problem within the framework of the 2030 Agenda. In this overall context, complex as it may sound, the UN Secretary General has just called for the implementation of the actions and recommendations of the common position in UN strategies and programs related to the three founding pillars of the UN, human rights, development and peace and security. This includes ensuring that the common position is reflected in UN sustainable development cooperation frameworks involving civil society and local communities, people who use drugs as well as women and youth. For its part, the United Nations Development Programme is working with its partners across the UN as well as with our academic and civil society partners to address the development dimensions of drug policy in the context of the 2030 Agenda. For instance, UNDP and other UN sister agencies are working with the University of Essex on the implementation of the International Guidelines on Human Rights and Drug Policy. It aims to help countries to address the issue of illicit drugs in line with their human rights obligations and their concurrent commitments under the International Drug Control Conventions. Indeed, as the technical lead for the UN socioeconomic response to COVID-19, UNDP is working to assess, alongside our sister agencies, the many social and economic impacts of the pandemic on economies and communities. This response includes working with partners such as the World Health Organization, UNODC, UNAIDS on issues related to access to services by people who use drugs during the pandemic. In closing, while much global progress has been made to tackle illicit drugs, there is much left to do. On the ground in 170 countries, UNDP is well aware of how COVID-19 is now presenting us with a range of new challenges. In particular, developing countries need solidarity and further concrete support to tackle illicit drugs, from confronting drug trafficking to ensuring the provision of key services to treat drug use disorders and related illnesses. Like other complex challenges, multilateralism is a key part of the solution. And as ever, the United Nations system will be there to offer and drive forward this vital support so that we can achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, promote dignity and justice and leave no one behind. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Steiner, for these remarks. Um, it's now my pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency Martin Chungong, Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. Mr. Chungong, you have the floor. Ms. Uh, Louise Abo, a member of the Global Commission on uh, 
uh, drug policy. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. I would like, first of all, to thank the Global Commission on Drug Policy for inviting me to take part in this side event on such an important topic for us at the Interparliamentary Union and one on which we have been focusing our efforts over the last two decades. I would like to take this opportunity to renew our sincere thanks to our partners, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, which provides substantial support to the IPU's initiatives in this area. We are in the presence of a scourge which has the potential to disrupt the social, political and economic stability of our societies and jeopardize our public health efforts. Problems related to drug abuse are still strongly associated with several diseases such as HIV AIDS and tuberculosis, among others. The 2015 edition of the UNODC report indicates that in 2013, there were an estimated 1.65 million people living with HIV who inject drugs. While the use of traditional drugs such as heroin and cocaine seems to be declining in some parts of the world, prescription drug abuse and new psychoactive substance abuse are gradually growing. Despite the progress made in some areas, the overall magnitude of drug demand has not substantially changed. In general, illicit use of drugs such as cocaine and heroin continues to incre increase in developing countries, notably in drug producing and transit countries. The impact of drugs on public health is an ongoing challenge for governments and I would say parliaments, especially in countries whose economies are already fragile. Young people are particularly vulnerable to drug use and especially in economically depressed areas with a general lack of education and working opportunities and are the first and easiest targets of criminal organizations in the recruitment process into illicit drug-related activities. The growing power and influence of these criminal organizations with their illegal and damaging activities combined with sometimes widespread distrust of local authorities undermine political institutions and the rule of law. Considering these phenomena which erode the foundations and pillars of our societies, urgent, large-scale action inspired and driven by political will should be taken as part of a multilateral approach involving all stakeholders concerned, including the groups and communities that are constantly exposed to the harmful effects of drugs. As part of this overarching strategy in which dialogue should remain a privileged tool, the role of Parliament is decisive considering its constitutional prerogatives. At the, level, at the legislative level, we need courageous reform of legal provisions that sets out to target traffickers while also creating a conducive environment for the care and reintegration of both direct and collateral victims of drug trafficking. As agenda setting actors, parliamentarians can trigger national deliberation processes inspired by the multilateral review process and can actively explore ways of bringing national legislation and policy into line with the international framework including the Action Plan on International Cooperation on the Eradication of Illicit Drug Crops and on Alternative Development, as well as the Guiding Principles on Drug Demand Reduction. Another area to which 
parliaments can contribute has to do with legislative innovation in drug policy, which would undoubtedly benefit from specialized research and recommendations by international experts. And of course, parliaments have the task of holding governments to account, making sure that adequate resources are allocated to implement drug policy, as well as ensuring that there is support from the public and civil society. Efforts should also be focused on combating the poverty, inequality and employment that drive many into working for criminal organizations. A paradigm shift in the approach to development is essentially required. Critical efforts should be made in promoting health, and in achieving peace, justice, and strong institutions, which correspond to Sustainable Development Goals 3 and 16, respectively, and where the Interparliamentary Union is concentrating its efforts. In 2019, the IPU adopted a resolution on universal health coverage, setting out Parliament's commitment to its achievement. Similarly, Parliament's should work towards building strong institutions that are resilient to organized crime. As an example of the multilateral cooperation approach to drug control that we need and want, I congratulate the Global Commission on Drug Policy for its commitment and its decisive efforts, particularly in West Africa. I am very pleased with the emerging partnership between our two institutions, especially in supporting interregional and multi-sectoral cooperation, the key to holistic action with a lasting impact. I would like to stress that the model drug law remains a critical tool in the creation of an environment that is hostile to traffickers and in the implementation of concerted action. The IPU is committed to backing the efforts of the Global Commission on Drug Policy in support of the West Africa Commission on Drugs and is an initiative set up with the involvement of the ECOWAS Parliament with whom the IPU enjoys long-standing cooperation. The findings and recommendations of such regional initiatives drawing on independent expertise to inform policy and lawmaking can be invaluable in finding innovative solutions to drug control. I thank you very much for your kind attention. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I want to very warmly thank all our panelists for their contributions to our continued search for better drug policies that will actually serve the aims and purposes of a proper international drug control regime, which is to enhance the health and welfare of humankind. The Global Commission will remain engaged in that pursuit, and we will continue to call on member states to embrace science-based policies, not only individually and regionally, but also collectively within the UN framework. And finally, I want to thank our patient audience, and I urge you all to remain engaged in whatever format on this issue, which is one of life and death for too many of our fellow human beings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.